All right. So the topic, like I said, guys, for the day is going to be uh, GFCI, EFCI. If you guys remember, we talked the last couple of chapters, we talked about the wiring methods, right? And where to the layout of all your receptacles and switches and how to wire receptacles and switches and so forth, how to lay them out in a, a residential building. So today we'll talk about how when you lay out your receptacles, Aram, you're supposed to put some safety embedded into your um, your power design system. That safety devices <coughs> is what is the what the topic for the meeting will be. We have uh, GXCI, the first safety device that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, let me get uh, my uh, highlighter here. There you go. Okay. So the first uh, device that we're going to be talking about guys, is GFCI location. That's the first one. Then the second one is going to be the ARC. The ARC, these are two devices that <laughs> one will protect you from the shock hazard and the other one will protect you or protect your system from the ARCs that could escalate into a fire. So they, these are protect, protective devices that you have to put in your system. Surge protective devices, um, emergency detection, and leakage, emergency detection and leakage, these are protect um, appliances. So GFCI, the first and the most important thing that GFCI will protect you from shock, I have my shock hazard. So shock hazard, GFCI, the main job of a GFCI is to protect the public from shock hazard. Then the AFCI came uh, in 2002 or so, um, and that, that to protect you from fire. Um, from arc, basically arc that leads into fire. Arc that leads into fire. So between the between the GFCI that protects you, the people, from being shocked, and the AFCI that protects you, the people, from being burned inside your house because of an arc, that these two devices are so powerful in 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 designing a residential residential building. They do not exist well. I'm not going to say they do not. They are not that much of a deal in a commercial industrial building. In a residential building, they're so powerful. So between these two devices, the last one is called surge protective devices. That will protect you from surges. And surges, anybody knows what a surge is? A surge is a, sm a very high amount of voltage and energy for a very short amount of time. Pulse. We used to call them pulse when I was in college. Pulsation. They have a pulse. So your power system, that's when it surges. Your power system is coming, is beautifully, look at this. Nice, everything is going well. And all of a sudden, a lightning hit the transmission line, right? When the lightning hit the transmission line, what happened? Bam, that goes all the way down and all the way up, and it goes back again to the normal operating condition. You see that little pulse that hit the transmission line? That's called surge, voltage surge. Now, if you don't handle that pulse because of lightning, hit the transmission line, went into the distribution line, went inside your building, if you don't handle it, your laptop will be fried. Not a big deal, but to fry your laptop. Okay, so that's these are the three things that we're going to talk about yesterday. So, GFC, especially the GFCI and the AFCI, um, these ITCIs, guys, the immersion detection devices, this is typically designed by manufacturer. And we'll talk about them. They're not a big deal, but they're designed by the manufacturer, not by us. Okay, we will talk about the uh, requirements. Where do you need to put AFCI and GFCI in a house? Um, and when you share a neutral, how sharing a neutral in the multi-wire branch circuit is uh, will uh, will not allow the AFCI or GFCI to do its job. So you cannot share a neutral unless the AFCI or GFCI is rated to be shared neutral. So in the return. So that's basically what we'll be talking about, guys, in a second, unless they're listed. Um, devices include them. And then we'll talk about um, in 2000, this year, in 2008, I want to say, we start caring about part of the shock hazard protection is tamper resistant to protect your son, Adam. You have three of them? No, or no children at all? <laughs> Just kidding you. Like Chad has three kids to prevent my son Adam from sticking a paper clip right into the hot slot right here because he is uh, inquisitive. You know what he did? He and one, one of his buddies, the air uh, phones, these, um, what do you call these, uh, little he headphones, 
in school, he and one of his buddies, he took one and put it in, took the one end, put it in one, the hot, the other end, put it in the neutral, and he blew him up in school. That's my son. So to protect, not kidding you, that's just the like last school year. Um, so they have to call us and they said, well, it's so sad that his dad is an engineer too, electrical engineer. So to, to protect my son and all the kids, they require them right now in all schools, grade schools. They require grade schools, homes, because of this. So they're called tamper resistant. And what are resistant, also the receptacle in dwellings has to be all tamper resistant weather resistance. If you put this receptacle direct outside in a house or at Dunwoody, outside in a winter dam location it has to be weather resistant weather resistant means guys it's made out of a material that can handle the elements that's all meaning hot cold in minnesota i don't know how many of you you're you probably you're not you haven't done a lot of wiring but if you have done a lot of wiring outside you open a box outside and and as you take the receptacle it falls apart in your hand because over 10 years of being beaten um, by the sun and the cold and so forth, it dis disintegrates. So that weather resistance is supposed to help you handle the elements. Uh, replacing existing receptacles uh, when you need a GFCI, there's a couple of rules that you have to know. Know the rules for providing GFCI protection for construction site. When you are on a construction site, you are to provide a receptacles for the construction site. Also, we'll talk about these ones. So what's the topic for the day, guys? Safety. Safety by installing safe devices. GFCI, AFCI, tamper resistant, weather weatherproof, or weather resistant, um, surge protective. It's all about safety devices. So make the electric after you decide where you're gonna put your receptacles, you're gonna make sure they're safe. Okay, understanding, and then we'll talk about the surge protective, which we use uh, almost everywhere in a commercial industrial building. Okay, electrical shock hazard. So this is just talking about, again, the topic when we talk about AFCI, GFCI, tamper resistance, all about people's safety. Shock hazard or arc flash that can create, or arc that can create a, a fire. Uh, equipment not properly, if, so you have to ground your equipment properly so you can eliminate the shock hazard. Um, shock hazard, guys, shock, what's the shock hazard? We're all smart enough other than my son to stick, not to stick a paper clip right here. Do you guys go home and stick a paper clip right into that little slot and hold on it? And to make it really more serious, even another paper clip here and hold on both of them. That's what we call it, the perfect, the perfect shock. Um, so most of us are smart enough not to do that. But who could be able to with you and holding on this little um, power pole here? And if this is energized because it will malfunction because it has power in it now. I could get electrocuted. So that's why we ground the equipments. Grounding the equipments and having GFCI and tamper resistance all about these are different methods of making that beautiful, wonderful uh, source of energy that's called electricity work safely. Can I get you guys to understand that one? The whole safety business. Okay. This is a few things about shock hazard. What happened to you when you have uh, shock hazard can cause internal damage. Here goes your lungs, here goes your uh, heart, here goes, you know, as the current goes through you, you are like a hot dog being fried um, if the current goes right through you, you in the right location. So, depending upon the amount of current, uh, the effect of the current on you will depend on how fat and plump you are. That will be your body resistance. Um, believe it or not, this is, this is one of the advantages, Derek, of being fat because your resistance is higher, less current. That's one advantage out of many disadvantages for us fat people. Um, you know, if you have more resistance, the current can't go through you fast enough. So your chance of survival is higher. Um, contact, uh, the contact duration, how long will it take you? The path is it going right from hand to hand through the heart. And also uh, humidity will affect the conductivity and the circuit characteristics. The circuit characteristics, are you holding on a 20 amp circuit or are you holding on a a thousand amp circuit. The, how much? Or is the voltage 120 or is the voltage 480? Higher voltage, higher current chances, lower chances of surviving a shock hazard. So because of all of this, we need to protect the public from the shock hazard. The first line of defense to protect the public, the shock hazard is GFCI. Um, so this is uh, 
typically, guys, if your voltage is less than 50, it's typically say higher than 50, higher than 50 volt, it becomes lethal. Higher than 50, so you have to provide some type of protection for, um, and that's where grounding the system higher than 50 and 50 or less. Um, and your body resistance can go from uh, a few hundred all the way to a few thousand, depending on how net and what you are, like we said. Uh, big, the bigger you are, um, the more resistance you're going to have in your body. Either way, though, it's not going to make you, if you have a perfect shock, it doesn't matter how fat and fluffy you are, you will go fast. It's the, the, the only difference, guys, between having bigger resistance body or less resistance body is how long will it take you to die. That's all, <laughs> if you have a perfect shock. So, okay, so that's, um, here's the GFCI, the curve for the GFCI. GFCIs are supposed to trip at six milliamps. So when you have that threshold right here, six milliamps, they are supposed to trip at six milliamps, as you can see. Um, and that's the threshold will, um, uh, within, within, look at the seconds, within point, can you see the range that they're gonna trip at? So you, you're talking about, range, and if you look at this picture, you're talking about point, uh, almost point oh three to uh, point oh six seconds seconds they trip so how fast they trip they trip fast and they trip if you want to exceed a six milliamps they trip so fast what's the what's why six milliamps six milliamps is more than six milliamps it becomes you can sense it and it could make damage to you and here's a curve we're having is if you can if you allow a current like for example um a 200 amps here to sit uh, for how long here? Let's just say for 0.5 of a second, 0.5 of a second, you're ju you have just joined the Lord, Karen. If you allow 200, what do you say, 200 and some amps, 280 or 40, to sit for um, 0.5 of an amps inside your body. So this curve, guys, will give you, this is where your heart stops, right at this right area. So the GFCI is your line of defense. Can you guys see it will work right here to protect you from all these currents, and the faster the current, the uh, the bigger the current, the faster it trips, and it starts the tripping mechanism starts right here at point um, at six milliamps. You see six milliamps or or more, it trips. Any comments, guys? Any questions? So if my son is to go grab guys from a GFCI, put the paper clips into the and this receptacle be the GFCI. You put a paper clip into the hot slot and you go grab into uh, something grounded. That GFCI should trip fast enough to protect my son and everybody's uh, loved ones too. Okay, any comments, guys? Any questions about the operation of the GFCI? Cool. All right, AC systems. Um, when you have a power system, most of the power system that we use in the US is between these two voltages for distribution. They're all equipment grounded um, and almost system grounded as well. And the reason why they grounded the system and we ground the equipment is for safety. So the first line of defense when you when you design a power system for safety, safety in mind is equipment grounding conductor. You do equipment grounding, you ground the system first actually, then you ground the equipment. Then you go, now that's line, first line of defense. Then you start adding devices that safe like GFCI and AFCI. Okay, now your GFCI location, guys, um, 210.8 give you all the GFCI locations for dwellings. If you don't know where you need a GFCI, Derek, all what you have to remember, any wet location must have a GFCI. Any wet location. So think of a house. Where would be wet in a house? Bathroom could be wet, GF, GFCI. How about kitchen countertop? Could be wet, right? Washing all the time, cooking, GFCI. Unfinished basement, it could be wet or damp, shock, because the shock, the shock becomes lethal, guys, if the location is wet, lethal. So any wet location, bathrooms, countertop kitchens, bars, how about a sink, a bar? If you have a bar with a sink in the middle of it, water, right? So if you have a receptacle within six feet, it has to be GFCI. Outdoor, GFCI, unfit garages, GFCI, unfinished basement, GFCI, crawl space, GFCI. Any question, guys, about the location in dwellings, GFCI? In non dwellings, the same thing. Any location that has water, outdoor, 
swimming pools around swimming pools gfci for example um you know so these are the location but let's focus on on the residential today any comments guys about the location in residential we need a gfci did we forget any one of them bathrooms countertop kitchen within six feet of a sink unfinished basement garage uh outdoor these are the locations that you need the gfci the only common denominator between all these locations, Derek, my friend, is what? The word what? Can you guys read this word for me? Water. Every time you guys have electricity in close proximity with water, you will exponentially increase the amount of the, the, the seriousness of the shock hazard. Did you guys hear me? Every time you have electricity in close proximity with water, you in exp exponentially increase the, um, the possibility of a lethal shock hazard. Cool? So that's why the smarter than Chad years ago say, well, if you have electricity exposed to the public, put GFCI. So if you are accidentally to grab on something, here they're energized, uh, then the GFCI will trip fast enough within milliseconds. Um, and within milliamps to protect you from joining the Lord. Okay, there's different ways of doing the GFCI, guys. You can have a GFCI circuit breaker, and um, um, that feeds multiple right here, that feeds multiple um, right in the panel, in the main panel. If you have a GFCI right in the main panel, what happens if, if it trips? That GFCI, it will trip, it will take with all the lights and the receptacle with it. This scenario, um, Karen, they use it a lot um, in, in Jerusalem when we designed that one. So you can use, uh, say, uh, it's a 30 amp or whatever, and with a 30 milliamp um, um, earth leakage, earth leakage. So if you see a, a 30 milliamp earth leakage is supposed to trip, 30 milliamp. That's one application used in other countries. Here in the US, what we use mostly is we protect with six milliamp or less and we put the protection right at the level of the brain circuit at, at the level of the brain circuit okay ground fault protection um if you have a receptacle dedicated it's not required i want to emphasize the word not required gfci not required for fire alarm as well as burglary alarm so if you have a fire alarm system in your basement Karen, and you're plugged into a receptacle in the basement that receptacle has to be gfci except because it's doing a lot burglary alarm and uh, fire alarm it does not have to be gfci any comments guys about the exception for gfci at willing fire alarm and burglary alarm in a basement is an exception you can use uh gfci circuit breakers that protect the entire brain circuits or you can use a device that protect the the receptacle itself or a bunch of receptacle downstreams and from the gfci um gfci we're going to see later on guys can uh, protect downstream so you can have one gfci here that can protect multiple downstreams they call it downstream protection so you can have a, a gfci here that protects a regular receptacle downstream they call it feed through the term that we use is feed through we'll look at the pictures in a second GFCI have to be tested, guys, and there is a reset button. So monthly tested. Your, so how many of you guys do that? Monthly test your GFCI to make sure that the mechanism works. Monthly test that GFCI, and there is a reset button. I do that in my bathroom because I'm shaving all the time. So whenever I, I'm sitting there and I just push the button, so it doesn't take much just because it's close proximate to me. Okay, so that's your GFCI. Any comments, guys, about GFCI? GFCI it protect you from shock hazard meant to protect the public we know where the location are you can either have gfci receptacle or gfci receptacle protecting multiple non-gfci receptacle or you can have a, a gfci circuit papers we'll see we'll look at a couple of pictures okay arc full circuit interrupters in 2000 wait, 2002 i believe when they start implementing arc full circuit interrupters arc full circuit interrupters guys if you look at the cable you see my cable here for my laptop Everybody can see the cable from my laptop. Now, if that cable is to, if you put a chair right on the top of the cable and freight the uh, conductors, damage the conductors, right? Could happen. 
in homes. They're pushing beds all the time, everywhere, kids throwing things. If you're like in my house, my son's kid is a zoo sometimes. So pushing things around. Now, what happens if you damage a, a conductor, guys, um, um, a cord going, a cord got damaged. And this cord damaged enough that you have an arc between a hot and a neutral or a hot and a ground. That arc could escalate into a fire before the circuit breaker wakes up. Because of that, so it could be in a cord or it could be also inside the receptacle or it could be inside the light or, or fridge. Because of that, the smart on that chat came up with the arc full circuit interrupter. Um, you can have right now, most of them are circuit breakers. You can have receptacles. In uh, 2011 NEC codebook, it's required in every location in a dwelling that does not have GFCI. Did you guys hear me? Every location in a dwelling that does not have a GFCI. For example, not required in the, in the kitchen. They're changing in 2014. Now it's going to be required in the kitchen. Laundry, not required in the laundry because the laundry have within six feet of a sink. In a laundry, you have to have GFCI. That's a bathroom. Outdoor, unfinished basements, these are all GFCI, not required AFCI. Uh, uh, garage, all these are AFCI, GFCI, not required AFCI. Everywhere else, like in bedroom, dining room, uh, living room, hallways, all these locations, gun room, powder room, whatever you have, all these rooms are requiring GFCI. Uh, AFC and GFCI protect against completely different function. GFCI shock hazard, AFCI arc that could escalate into a fire. Any comments, guys, about these two devices? Arc false uh, circuit interrupter protect you from an arc that can escalate into a fire. GFCI protect you from the shock hazard. The shock hazard. Here's all the location by any sequence of 2011 that require uh, an AFCI. Now, Adam, the common denominator between these are no GFCI. Can you guys see that? Look at this. From family to dining to living to parlor to libraries, dens, bedroom, sunroom, recreation room, closets, if you have any hallways, and similar areas. The only exception is unfinished base. Any place where you have a GFCI. Think about it. The places that you need a GFCI you know, are excluded. In 2014, guys, they added, uh, I believe they added the laundry, laundry and they also added um, the kitchen. And AFCI, guys, is required on both. Can I get you to understand? It's required on both receptacles as well as light. GFCI is only required on what? Receptacles. On receptacles. Before I leave this one, any comments, guys, about AFC and GFCI? Everybody understand GFCIs? We deal with receptacle protection. AFCI, we deal with receptacles as well as lights. Receptacles as well as lights. Tamper resistant receptacles, these are uh, required to, to, uh, to, for small children so they don't stick the paper clips right into the hot slot and, and electrocute themselves. Uh, required in all the receptacles in dwellings. Every single receptacle in a dwelling must be tamper resistant. Uh, what would that do to your budget, Karen? It will increase a 33 cent uh, receptacle into a buck 30. So they're slightly expensive, more expensive than the regular ones. Okay, this is tamper resistant. Then we have weather resistant, the WR and the TRs, weather resistant. These installed in any damp or wet location, any damp or wet location must must have a receptacle weather resistance. They make them more robust that they can handle the element. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand where tamper resistance and weather resistant receptacle are required. Wet damp location, you have to put tamper um, uh, weather resistant. Tamper resistance, every single receptacle in the house now has to be tamper resistant. GFCI, non GFCI, all of them um, have to be tamper resistant. Any comments, guys, about tamper? They are running, like I said, three times, two to three times more expensive than the one you're looking at in my hand if it's tamper resistant. Required everywhere in dwelling and a couple of other places too. Okay, now if you have um, replacing non-grounding type receptacles, there are a few rules, guys, to replace non-grounding. Uh, if you have a non-grounding all days, non-grounding receptacle, you can replace um, a non-grounding receptacle with a non another non-grounding receptacle with a GFCI 
or with a grounding receptacle fit from a GFCI and labeled with no equipment grounding conductor. So these are a few locations where you can replace. I have a couple of pictures um, that you guys will uh, will look at. Okay, the last thing, temporary wiring GFCI. The sequence book does require you if you're doing temporary wiring like construction, carrying on a job, 15, 20, and 30 amps, 120, and 240, 120 receptacle must be GFCI protected. So if you have 15, 20, 30, 120, 240 slash 120 receptacles must be GFCI on a construction site. And why do you think we care about putting GFCI on construction site? Because we don't want to kill the electricians, right? They're working. Uh, so you have to have um, a lot of electricians guys also have portable GFCI required by OSHA. If you don't have a GFCI, uh, receptacle plugged in, you have to have a portable GFCI. Portable GFCI, uh, portable uh, ground fault circuit and rupture cord set. They call them a cord set that you can plug in. There's a couple of pictures coming. Any comments, guys, about GFCI in a dwelling? GFCI in a dwelling and a construction site. Cool. Now, the last thing is these are, guys, IDCI. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of these and ALCI, these are Emerging Detection Circuit Eruptor. Um, if you, the appliance is like, if you're grooming your hair in the morning, which you do a lot, right, Derek? Grooming your hair, do it, <laughs> picking on you. <laughs> well, as you groom your hair in the morning, uh, if you drop the, uh, the grooming appliances that you're using accidentally in a sink full of water, right? Could it happen? with my wife all the time, um, or a sink or the bathtub is full of water and accidentally you're grooming and you fill uh, into that tub full of water or sink full of water. The smarter than Chad, the, uh, the appliances guys have a big plug, fat plug. Inside it, there is a sensor that can sense that this appliances have been immersed in, in water and it will de-energize the equipment immediately. Why? Because you don't want to electrocute somebody who is his hand in the sink or if somebody is taking a shower or taking a bath and you drop something inside that bathtub full of water. You don't want to electrocute him. So it will instantly, immediately, not instantly, immediately um, de-energize appliances. So we don't care. We don't get involved in this. It's appliances. The manufacturer appliances will take care of that. So these are the appliances. You drop it, uh, drop into the water or get wet, the ID or the AC will safely de-energize appliances so you don't get electrocuted. So this is a protection for appliances. Uh, a good example of hair dryers, combs, uh, curlers, and so forth is a good example of these. In a construction site, guys, typically they have a panel like this, uh, temporary power, and all the receptacles here um, 15, 20, 30, uh, 120, 240 slash 120 will be GFCI, will be GFCI. Surge protective devices. Surge protective devices, guys, is supposed to protect you from surges. There are two types of surges. The first one is the impulse. The impulse is coming out of lightning will get you an impulse. Utility, electrical utility switching will get you an impulse. Um, a transient and an impulse guys like we said here's a voltage coming in really cool then it goes very high and it comes back back all the way here can you guys see that this is my impulse so what happened is that will burn your equipment the smarter than chad decided we're going to design a, a device it's called surge protective device and it looks at that little pulse and if it sees the pulse, it's so simple, Dirk, it shuts it, it shuts it down to the ground. So it takes it down to the ground. So it gets rid of that little leg here. Who cares? Your electronic equipment will survive. That's the surge that's coming out of impulse. The rain wave, guys, these are also like pulses generated from electronic equipment uh, and printers and so forth. Um, Again, disturbance in the system generated by internally inside the building. It could be the VFD of the air handling unit, the printer, um, copiers, computers, and so forth. Could create a transient pulsation um, that could damage your equipment. So a surge protective device will prevent these equipment, take these uh, pulsations, suck them down 
and bring him down to the ground. Connect him, literally take the phase and shunt it down to the ground for a very short amount of time to get rid of that transient. So that's basically what, um, what surge protected devices. Where is it required by code? It's not required anywhere in dwellings. Um, a lot of you guys say TVSS uh, receptacles. You've seen them TVSS receptacles. There's three different types. One of them is a receptacle, and the other one is surge protected device, like in a box. You put it right by the panel on the load side or on the line side of a disconnect means. Any comments, any questions, guys, before I share with you a few pictures about what we just said? A few pictures. So that's um, that's basically what the topic. All these are supposed to design a, a protective system, a power protective system. So let me just quick here um, go with you because you're my friends. Um, okay, just share a few a few um, slides here. We talked about yesterday, guys. Uh, I hope you remember when we talked about the these most. The, I would say 90% of your brand circuit in a building are are 14, 12, and 10, 15, 20, and 30. 90% of your brand circuit. So they limit them to limit the ambition coming out of them. And we talked about this one, I believe. We talked about this curve. Um, GFCI location, guys. Here's a nice picture about the location of GFCI. Um, and um, if you look, all these receptacles that you're looking at have to be GFCI'd, excluding the fridge. Excluding the fridge, excluded. Uh, why? Because they are in close proximity of water. Countertop, kitchen countertop, sink. I have within six feet of a sink. Within six feet of a sink, um, then it has to be a GFCI. Any comments, guys, about these GFCI? You are laying out the kitchen for me, two by four, the rule two by four. Here's an island where you have to have one receptacle for every island, one receptacle for every peninsula, and the rules are two by four along measured uh, along the walls of the kitchen, kitchen countertop. Okay, so these all have to be GFCI, close proximity. We talked about using a branch circuit GFCI, feeding receptacles and lights. Not a good idea if to use a, a GFCI circuit breaker if you're feeding lights too, because if you use, if it trips, it will take the light with it. So might not be a good idea. The best application, guys, is when you use a circuit breaker, uh, uh, a device GFCI, like this baby. Now, if something to... Uh, if you have any current that's going from here into the ground, this will trip, and only, only that that device will be de-energized. That device will be de-energized. Okay, so uh, ground fault circuit interrupter installed here in the panel. They use them on the feeder sometimes too. Um, shuts off the feeder GFCI. All circuits in this panel will be again. That's used in other countries. That system, not commonly. I've never seen it here. How does the GFCI work? I'm sure you guys have dealt with that, especially the ones who came from the electrical field. Very simple. They have a little sensor. I don't know if you guys can see that sensor here. That sensor measures the current coming in versus the coming, coming out. In, out, sensor. If it sees a substantial difference, which is six milliamps or more, it trips. It sends then, it, when it senses it, it sends a signal to the electronic circuitry, the brain. The brain, when it sees six milliamps, it opens, there's a shunt, shunt trip. There's a little coil, energize that little coil, and that little coil, bam, open this circuit breaker. Or open this device. There's a contact, not a circuit breaker, contact inside the, um, the GFCI. It opens that contact and de energize the circuit. That's it, as simple as that. There is a little uh, testing bind. When you do a test bind, guys, they shrunk, they take you from the heart to the ground. They fool, they basically fool the system to believe. They fool the system to believe that you have a um, a ground, a heart to ground current. Um, until you see that, they take it from here behind. They take it behind the. Um, they take it. They don't put. They don't. They take it from before it enters the that um, the CT. And that will allow you guys to test that web. Test that web. Any comments? Any questions? Any comments, guys? Any questions? So this will continue to work if that gentleman is to get uh, grab something hot here and walking barefoot, say, 
the current will go right here. You will see a substantial difference with the six. This is uh, 46 milliamps. It will trip. Why? Because now there is a difference between what came up in versus what came back. What came into the circuit versus what came back. That substantial difference, 6 milliamps, trips. Any comments, guys, about the operation of GFCI? 4 to 6 milliamps, you're out. It will trip. Here's how it looks like. You guys have seen it. There's reset button. You're supposed to monthly test these babies. If you have a circuit breaker GFCI, which you're allowed to do, then you have... Um, did you wire them, uh, Adam, here with us? Yeah. So you have the neutral. You have to land the neutral independently. You can't share with anything else. You know that it comes with a neutral uh, device. So you take your hot and then it comes a hot and a neutral coming into that device. So that has to go land into um, into the neutral bar, into your neutral bar. Um, so you got your uh, in and out for this circuit. And um, so that the neutral. OK, so we got. Um, um, a couple of other location guys feed through. You can have a GFCI right here feeding multiple uh, other GFCIs. We'll have an example of that. Here's how GFCI, most of GFCIs guys have a feed through mechanism. Um, so you can bring, there's a line side, the line side, and the load side. On the load side, you can feed multiple non-GFCI receptacles. So that GFCI acts, you've seen it, act as a protection for anything downstream. That will get you cheaper equipment to install. Any comments, guys, about, and you know how to wire it, right? You bring the circuit in, circuit out goes, uh, there's load and line. So you bring the circuit to the line, and you take it away from the load. Here's how it looks like. You bring the circuit to the line side from the loads. Now this is completely fully protected, GFC protected, as well as anything on, this is fully protected, um, the GFC will trap protect itself and anything plugged into it as well as anything fit through it. So now that's where you can have a regular uh, uh, receptacle. We call them GFCI protected. In the countertop, were you asking me, Adam, or somebody was asking me, do we need all of them GFCI? Not really. You need only one GFCI. The rest can be non-GFCI fit through. What's wrong with that? Cheaper. Can I make all of them GFCI receptacle? Absolutely, you can. What's wrong with that? It's more expensive. You, you're looking at twelve dollars versus a buck fifty, or a buck thirty. All those are protected. Yeah, anything you take, anything you take from here is protected. Anything you take from the load side of a GFCI is fully protected, fully protected, and approved by code too. Okay, here's a couple of ways of feeding through from a GFCI, guys. Some of them are uh, proper, others are improper. The proper way of feeding, I'm going to emphasize the proper. When you come, you have to come from the line side. If you want to feed, you have to go from the load side. So you can see the load is here. The line side is right in here. Very, very important. What's wrong with this one here? The wrong with this one is we... This location, can you see here? We took one wire from the line and one wire from the loop. Can you see that? That will trip the circuit breaker immediately, and the GFCI, the line and the load, to tripping them. The same thing here too. You can't uh, you can't bypass them. You can't bypass them. So the proper way of connecting them is to always come into the load. If you want to feed through, you have to go through the load. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Any comments? Any questions? You can't alter and bypass because it will trip. It will see it as um, uh, look at this one here. There's a five amp difference, and that will uh, that will be C and G F C circuit picker requires a neutral co connection. You you need a neutral connection, otherwise it will trip or not operate. Okay, so that's basically your G F C I. Here's your monthly list. Uh, test record that you're supposed to test them every month and every year and so forth. Make sure you test all your, your uh, GFCI. If they're circuit picker or if they are um, um, if they're circuit picker or if they are devices. Here's another method that inspectors guys use to test your GFCI. A nice device. You can plug it in, push it. GFCI should trip. AFCI should trip if you push it in. 
um, and as well as you can test if the node shows connected properly. Have you guys seen that? You've seen, I don't know if, uh, pa, if Karen has one in her lab that tests all these in one. So when the inspector walks in, you don't have to miss around. Plug him in. This room has to have GFCI protection. Yeah, push GFCI, yeah, trip. This room has to have AFCI on it. Push that by the up, it trips. So it, it helps the, the uh, in, in authority. Okay, tamper resistant. Here's how a tamper resistant receptacle will look like. It has a TR on it for tamper resistant, and there's some little device here um, that, in order for to activate this uh, uh, receptacle, you have to push simultaneously. The plug has to be pushed simultaneously into the hot and the neutral slots in order to be able to push that receptacle. If you try to push something in one slot at a time, it would not allow you to do so. So now what happened if you push two, two paper clips, one in this and one in that one, and push them together? Now, now that, that wouldn't protect you. That would not protect you. That's, the, I hate to say it, but that's called natural selection. If you're intended in doing that. Yeah. Even GFCI would not protect you. Even GFCI would not protect you. Okay, so that's um, that's your timber resistant, different type of timber resistant. Weather resistant, guys, weather resistance, it has WR in it. So all, I want you guys, when you design your system, Adam, you're going to have a note in your sheet drawings that says all outside receptacles, all receptacles in wet location or damp location must be WR, weather resistant receptacle. So when the inspector's bed, when you guys take off your you will be doing take off on this job when you do them take off that receptacle will cost you a couple of dollars versus the other receptacle that's going to cost what 33 or 50 cents that's a wet or damp location uh, can you guys see it's also timber resistant it has to be also timber resistant timber resistant and wet and damp uh, wet location weather resistant weather resistance as well as timber resistant here's a timber resistant gfci you can you can get tamper resistant. Here's a tamper resistant, weather resistant GFCI. That will run you $18. Tamper resistant, weather resistant GFCI. Where would you put something like this? Outside receptacles. They have to be tamper resistant because they're in the, in the dwellings, GFCI, and weather resistant. Here's an $18. Okay. Now, if you uh, replacing, um, if you guys get into a remodeling, and you walk into an apartment building that has a non grounding type receptacle like this, right? You walk into homes all the time. How are you going to replace these receptacles? One of them is faulty. So the only way, okay, you can replace it with another one. They make them non grounded. It's not an option, by the way, in Minnesota now, because if you replace them in a house, in a in a bedroom. It has to be arc fault circuit inter uh, interrupters, and how are you going to get an arc fault circuit interrupters here? So you have to go mess around with the circuit almost. So there's a whole lot of issues there. But you can replace it with non grounding, or you can replace it with a GFCI, is another option, or you can replace it with a grounding type as long as you feed um, this receptacle from a GFCI. So if you feed you can replace this one, put it here, as long as you feed it from a GFCI. And I'm sure Karen told you guys that you have to put a label here, must, that says no equipment grounding conductor in it. No equipment grounding conductor. Well, in this, the picture that I'm showing right now has, if the box has an equipment grounding conductor, not a big deal. You can replace, if it has an equipment grounding conductor, you don't have this issue. The challenge becomes actually, is if you don't have an equipment on conductor, that's when it becomes. Um, so you walk into a box like this. Can you just see there's only two hots, no equipment on conductor? You have three options. Option number one, you put this side of receptacle, except the owner can't plug anything that has a grounding bra in it, right? You can't. That's where they hate it. Option, the cheapest option to do it actually is to put GFCI or the. So you plug this one instead of that one, that's completely acceptable. And you put right down in here, no equipment grounding conductor. You have to label it with no equipment grounding conductor. That's what we do. 
Or a third option is to, to go to one GFC, but this time, but you have to feed it from a GFCI. That typically is not a big, it's not an option because you're missing receptacle. Where are you going to find a GFCI? So these are the three options that you're going to have when you are placing a GFCR and non-GFCI receptacles. Um, here's, here's what the option of feeding, you replace it with the grounding pad receptacle, except you have to feed it from where? From a GFCI. From a GFCI. And you have to put a label right here that says no equipment grounding conductor. No equipment grounding conductor in this boy. They also allow you guys connect to to replace it with a tribe like this and take an equipment running conductor externally. You see this in basement, you, you replace it with this and you take an external equipment running conductor, you can connect it anywhere in the ground electrode system to a five accessible point of the ground electrode conductor, equipment ground terminal bar, any, any of these locations, grounded service conductor within a service uh, equipment. So you take that wire, and you tie it all the way to the ground electrode system, like a pipe, a water pipe, and so forth. You see this a lot in the basements where it's accessible. So you put this receptacle. on. So the wires, all the wires come together here, except one wire comes out and goes its own direction and tie it to the pipe in, 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 in the basement. Not a good design, but that's acceptable too. Okay, if you're if you're on a construction site, guys, most of construction sites, not most, all of them. Uh, based on OSHA uh, protection, shock hazard protection, have to, when you plug your equipment, you have to plug it with uh, a GFCI receptacle or a portable um, GFCI set, portable GFCI cord set like this one, where everything is protected from GFCI. Turtle. The turtle. So that's must. Here's another way of doing it, GFCI protection. GFCI, different type of GFCI protection. Um, another way of doing it, guys, on the side, they have, they typically provide circuit breakers and they provide GFCI protection right here, GFCI protection. And even, even people with, even guys, the standard in the industry, even if the receptacle is GFCI, you always plug that set into it. So you have your own GFCI protection. I mean, that's a standard. Okay, surge protective device. The last thing, guys, is a surge protective device. This is how these work. Really interesting. Um, every engineering project I work on here, um, Karen, my friend, has, we specify a surge protective device right at the service, right at the service, inside the service, or outside the service, next to the service. So here's what happened. You're, like I said, your, uh, your voltage is coming nice and beautiful all of a sudden. You've got a transient into your system, huge transient, and all of a sudden it goes back. So that transient, only this part of the transient, what happened is then at that time, this will close. It takes the transient down this path, and typically down, down the ground actually. It takes it all the way down to the ground. It's tied to the ground. It takes it down to the ground and away from the loads, shunts it. That's what the job of it, shunts it. They tie it line to, the, uh, they tie, they, it can be you know, line to line, line to neutral, to ground, line to line to ground, line, line to neutral to ground. So, And when everything is under normal operating condition, it allows the system to go. Can you see the transient? That's the job of a surge protective device. I don't know if you can see, look at the signal after and the signal that's coming in. Thanks God, these does not happen often, guys. Lightning, surges, it's not like normal. These are abnormal operation. Transient, they call them transient because they don't stay. If they stay, they damage your equipment. No question asked. They're short, they're an ugly, bad, short, infrequent. So the surge protective devices since them, shunt them down, take them to the ground, and after it goes, your laptop will survive that uh, transient situation. Could be caused from lightning, transmission lines, switching, or from internal switching inside your building. So that's engineering project. They can, uh, uh, there's different types. You guys use your plasma TV, probably plug, you can buy a receptacle like this. A receptacle like this one that says, um, this is a transient receptacle. 
it senses that there is a transient and it sucks it take it to the ground away from you. Um, so isolated looks like an isolated ground too on it. Here's another one. A lot of people surge protection, right? When you go and you have plasma TV, they always recommend you to buy a surge protection, right? A power strip like this. Um, so these are you can buy them. This is what we engineer inside the panel, not dwelling inside the panel. What they do, guys, is they come and they put that device right here and they tie it, they tie it to the line side right in here, to the line side or to the load side, or to the load side. Typically, with an overconfliction device. Um, so typically, to the load side, they put it on the load side, and um, it will protect the whole building. Cool. There are three types of uh, surge protection, guys. There's type one, type two, and type three. Type one, type one is usually right here. No. Type two is right here on the load side. Type three is down, 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 down at the receptacle. Type three. The difference between them is more robust. This guy is more robust, can handle right at the surface. Right in the point of circuit paper, this robust, the least robust. Now, if you have, if you want a full protection for the whole building, Derek, the whole building, this is the best way to do it. One on the line side, one on the load side, and one all the way downstream. That so that will, it, it, it's like the first one will take the first hitter. Whatever runs away from whatever, whatever the first doesn't clear properly, the second will. Whatever the second does not clear completely, the third will take care of it. They call them coordinated. So, but at least one of them that you can do. Um, this is just the shock hazard. Men and women, men can handle it more than women. Um, 15M, GFCI, tripping, AFCI. Okay, let me see. There we go. I'm going to go back to here i'm going to wire that gfc any question guys before i just finish that wire for this and let you go lecture wise for today any comments so we talked about devices that protect you when you distribute your power system gfci shock protection in any wet location afci arc arc protection that create fire in a building everywhere in the house that doesn't have a gfci receptacles and light then we talked about tamper resistance everywhere in every receptacle uh, 15 and 20 amp 120 and then we talked about um, weather resistant any receptacle in damp or wet location must be again to to maintain the integrity of these devices and the last thing i believe we talked about guys is surge protection that will be right at the panel or just a receptacle or it could be a circuit breaker or it could be a power strip like you've seen it um so the um, emergent detection devices we don't talk too much about them because they're they're manufactured by the they're provided by the manufacturer of the equipment they're part of the plug that's why the plugs are big fat because they have this protection they sense that there's water and they just drip okay let's go guys um i have a gfci system here and i want to protect i want to feed um these two gfcis from um uh, from from a surface. Shall we do the wiring and then we'll uh, just review a, a few wiring with you? Okay, circuit number one supply GFC receptacle one and two. Uh, circuit uh, circuit A two supply GFC receptacle three and four. Okay, three and four. Okay. Uh, okay, three and four. And uh, feed through time, use color, pencils, or marker. So this is one of the examples, guys. So we have circuit um, circuit uh, one and two, circuit circuit A2 supplies GFCI receptacles, receptacles uh, three and uh, three, uh, three and four, three and four. Okay, or, or receptacles three and four, got it. And then um, receptacle one and three, one and three are feed through using, okay, one and three are feed through. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna make these feed through and, and feed them from these two circuits. Shall we do it together? 
Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is circuit number two, guys. I have the line side and the load side. I'm going to come from here and land it on the line side. My neutral is going to come from here and land on uh, the line side, right? On the load side, my load side is going to come from here to the load side and from here to the load side. Any comments, guys? So now I have a GFCI protecting coming from circuit A2 that this is GFCI, this is GFCI protection. Can you guys see the line side versus the load side? And for my my ground, can you guys see my ground? My ground will come from here to here, and then from here it has to go all the way to the ground. Any comments, guys, about the first circuit? Any comments about the first circuit? Straightforward. The second circuit is very identical. Um, come from here, line side, come from here, shared neutral, uh, load side. And then the load side is going to go, we're going to come from this side, we're going to come from this side. GFC, you need a ground, you come from here, and you go all the way to the ground. This is how you feed two circuits. You feed two circuits, guys, to two different systems. Two circuits to two different systems. Any comments, any questions? Any comments, any questions? There's so many ways of doing it. This is one way, if that's what they want, a description. Now, I could, I could feed these two from one GFCI, if I want to. So, right? Depending on how, how, they, how they're located in the house, you can wire them. Any comments, guys, about wiring a GFCI? GFCI, GFCI feed through. Very, very important. When you bring, you always bring that circuit to the line side. You always take the feed through from the load side. The feed through from the load side. Now, here's my question for you, uh, Derek, my friend. What if you don't have a, a feed through? What if I don't want to feed it through? So these two terminals feed through will just sit there. Then you're not tying anything to it. The worst thing that could happen to you to bring the line into the load side wouldn't trip. So it has to go, the lines, the circuit has to come to the line side, the load side, if used, if, big if, sometimes we don't use it, if used, then you pull directly from the load side to whatever you need to protect with GFCI, whatever you need to protect with GFCI. Any comments, guys, any questions? People will be looking to you guys to protect their power system. It's not enough in our industry to design a fully functional power system. That's a must. For the system to work efficiently and to work to work efficiently is a must. It's also have to work safe. That's where all these devices came to be for safety. GFCI, AFCI. Um, and surge protection, timber resistant devices, uh, weather weather resistant devices, all these are to make the power system safe for the consumers, for the public. Any comments, guys, about this? Comments, questions? That's all I have for you today. So what I'm hoping is, please, before we leave today, I would like you guys to print the E1 through E12 in CAD on 11 by 17. And I'm hoping you guys can finish maybe the first floor power. Uh, but keep, keep rolling. I mean, the due date is next week. But the more you finish, the better. Thank you.